Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. With me, as always, Mark Fielding. We'd, uh, yeah. What's what's new, my guy? You were uh, out in a river this morning. Uh, that, that looked <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I, I thought that our guest Israel, his his writings suited a natural environment. I'm great, actually. Um, I've been reading this, the jazz. Oh of my physics, gosh, one of the, my favorite the, books ever. The secret link between music and the structure of the universe. I love string theory. I love my mind being blown up by the scale of the universe. Complicated book, though. A lot of the complex maths I didn't get. I'll have to read it again. But that's been good. Um, Work-wise, I've been writing um, a law bible for a game today. This week, I've been developing Ooh. worlds and characters. So that's pretty cool. How about you? Why don't, how's your week been? And why don't you tell the, the, the listeners about our sponsor? Yes, yes. Well, first of all, my week has been largely um, me trying to get comfortable on the couch. Uh, my my vocal timbre is a little different today, but I'm just starting to feel better. I've I've had about three days of something pretty gnarly. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm definitely feeling better and happy to be uh, among the vertical living beings. So uh, so thankful for that. Yeah, our our sponsor, um, the folks at Ripple with a W. Mark, uh, marketing's talent on demand, on demand talent platform. These guys are awesome. They've been great partners of ours, uh, Dixie and Ray and the whole team over there. Um, and the freelance economy is getting huge, right? Like a lot of people, including ourselves, our freelancers work with a lot of other companies get brought in for our expertise, for our specialty. I think even our guests today, uh, would probably fit into that mold as well. But it's, yeah. sometimes it's really difficult to get connected with jobs and with opportunities. And Ripple has this amazing platform where uh, vetted freelancers like myself, I'm actually on the platform. I'm not sure if you've made it on there yet. Are you in? Mark is in now. Um, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in the waiting room. Awesome. Well, I'm sure it'll progress through. But uh, we go through a vetting process, which is, which is pretty cool. And then uh, brands can actually put their requests up for uh, positions they need. Uh, roles they need filled or particular projects. And uh, and it works great. There's like 3,200 plus vetted freelancers, brands like um, you know Equifax and AT&T are using this platform. So I definitely encourage you folks to check them out. Uh, if you're a freelancer looking for opportunities or trying to expand into newer opportunities, uh, give them a check and uh, Dixie's around and uh, can help you out with that. So thank you to Ripple. I think they're called solopreneurs now, aren't they? Oh, that could be. That could be another term. I like that. I it's like quite, that. It's quite a big kind of trending subject to the solopreneur guru and this shift from freelancing, which sounds a little bit solopreneur sounds more regal, more. Yeah, freelancer, I guess that's a good point. Freelancer has a bit of a a flighty nature to to the sound of it, right? Even though it's like you're a, you're an expert getting dropped into some of the craziest spots. Yeah. I mean, my, myself, the projects I've been pulled into, and Israel, our guest today, he he probably has a ton of these where he literally gets dropped into chaos and has to figure out and organize what what a particular company is doing. But um, solopreneur definitely has a little bit more of a more of a shine to it, I guess. Um, well, without further ado, let's 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 bring our guest. I'm really excited. This is this this topic. This is going to be a bit of a jazz episode, I think, because uh, there are so many things that our guest today uh, is involved in and has done. Yeah, the jazz of Web three today, not the jazz of physics. But um, one thing that caught my eye uh, about what Israel has been doing is actually making complex technology, complex emerging tech rather tangible and executable in, in multiple ways. And it's not very easy to do because you have to, you have to A, know the tech inside and out, and you have to B, understand how to apply it to someone's business in a meaningful way, right? Or else yeah. it's, or else people just get scared, right? Because they'll read the news and be like, oh, this is all Silk Road, Bitcoin, BS, right? Or whatever. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to bring in yeah. uh, our friend Israel Wilson. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. How are you guys doing this morning? Awesome. Thank you. Man, couldn't be better. Couldn't be better. It's great to see you. Uh, what side of the world are you on today? I am in, I'm on the Jersey Shore. This oh, is nice. The place I call, this is the place I call home. This is my reset. Um, my daughter uh, said to me uh, one day, she said, Daddy, I forgot you had shoes. <laughs> I don't go anywhere. I'm, I'm, you know, I travel so much of the year. Um, I've actually taken a little break of, from traveling 
because of uh, like a reset or did some of the things I'm working on. But um, the Jersey Shore is my home. I know I know Jersey better than anywhere else. I was born on the West Coast, grew up on the West Coast, but no place closer to my heart than New Jersey. You is that? Are you anywhere near Cape May? Nowhere. Okay. Nothing is near Cape May. Cape May is beautiful, though. I know people that Cape May is one of those places like Martha's Vineyard or what that case may be. Like, yeah, more people summer there probably than live there. It's at the very southern tip of of new jersey god how big got it. how big is new jersey because i'm from europe so for me it's new jersey new as... jersey is like about this big but i guess it's massive <laughs> yeah for europe it I, you know in european comparison i guess it's a uh, it's as big it could be possibly as big as a small country but in the united <laughs> states i would say um it's smaller than los angeles county so it takes less time to drive through here and i grew up in san diego county and definitely far smaller in San Diego County, um, but it's got 572 different municipalities and a, a terrible political system. Not one of my favorite things, and a terrible tax system because but, of it. But Israel, okay, again from a European, from a Brit, East Coast or West Coast, where is the 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 most the the, the better or the more interesting Web three emerging tech community vibe business, East or um, West Coast? On both sides, um, you know, in on the East Coast, I would say that Miami is the most interesting Web3 community, active Web3 community, and, and so deep and probably a place that pulls a lot of people. Also, there are a lot of people that live in Puerto Rico, so they can just come and hop in and out of Miami at will. There's like a crypto, a crypto community in Puerto Rico. If anybody hasn't visited and you're into crypto, I would tell you it's probably a good good place to go. I went to a conference there called Metaverso by G Money a couple of years ago and had an interesting time. Um, uh, New York has, uh, you know, New York has had has one of the oldest Crypto Mondays communities. If maybe not the oldest Crypto Mondays community, my friend Ab used to run that and they've got a lot of, um, you know, stuff going on in New York. But L.A. has an amazing, you know, an amazing community. They're thriving. I would say LA, as far as NFTs, probably has one of the active, most active artist communities. There, a lot of the artists that thrived during the during the boom um, of of this of this of the NFT craze um, live live in um, LA and Venice. There's a place called Brighter Moments. They actually moved to New York, but they had a gallery. In uh, where you could only get an NFT live and you had to be on a list. And the NFT had like a, a crazy floor and they've got a gallery there. And then, but then places like San Francisco and Portland have a scene. Chicago has a, has a small scene, you know, but I would say that Miami probably out of every place in the United States across the board from the people who are actually working for L1s and L2s to the people who are launching um, NFT marketplaces and a lot of finance people. Um, it's a, it's a nice place to live, you know. It's a nice place to at least visit, even if you don't want to live there. Yeah, Miami early on had had very big buy in from the mayor, uh, and you know that that probably opened up a lot of doors too. I think down there, right? Very vocal mayor, if I remember correctly, right? Um, very vocal around Bitcoin. So he's oh, very, just Bitcoin. Okay, big, yeah, Bitcoin friendly and things like that. There's a lot. You know, uh, um, a lot of a lot of people who have educated um, the masses around uh, around cryptocurrencies are Bitcoin maximalist. You know, and me, you know, I'm I'm I was I was at that stage. I've been in crypto since the very beginning, so I was at that stage as well over time. But as a person who wanted to see things built when they didn't expand the block size of Bitcoin for the same reason. If, if they if they expanded the block size of Bitcoin and Vitalik may have built Ethereum on Bitcoin, but since they didn't, then, you, you know, he built it, he built out the world's, what's called on the, on the white paper, the, the world's computer. And that was the most inspiring thing to me to read about DAOs and, um, and, and what, what the future may hold I didn't foresee it this way. I thought that DAOs would be the, that the autonomous layer would be the, 
the smart contract would act in autonomy. And I've envisioned it as like this robot controller. And for me, I'm a proponent of that because of the fallacy of human beings and their actions and their, the way in which they act around things like governance. Instead, that autonomous layer became, I, I had an epiphany a couple of months ago that that autonomous layer became the uh, autonomy of the human beings within the organization. Um, and um, so the manifestation of that paper came different, but no, but um, Mayor Suarez is very, you know, deeply into Bitcoin and supports Bitcoin and a lot of, you know, a lot of people around there focused on Bitcoin stuff, but I just want to say. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's dive into DAOs. You, you yeah. talked about, I've been a, a big, you know, I was super interested. I've always been super interested in DAOs, uh, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations and uh, I wrote for uh, an organization called NFT Plazas. I did a basically a year long DAO study where I would publish an article about DAOs, and it actually ended up being like pulling the thread back on you know what the human element needs to be in order for the technological element to be created, right? And and actually, I, then I saw a lot of organ or a lot of companies coming out and building. Uh, DAO tooling, meaning like, hey, here's one button DAO, like Syndicate and DAO House and all of these folks. I'm like, oh, this stuff's going to happen. Like everything's going to be DAOs. Like what in the world, right? There's been a bit um, of a, but it's kind bit of, of a hit. backlash what? against DAO, the DAO philosophy of late. It's, it's changed radically in the last year. Like the, 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 the enthusiasm for it 12 months ago was a lot stronger than it is now. Is that right? I would say two years ago. Um, I think that you know, a lot of misuse, misuse of DAOs and NFTs as methodologies. And this happened in 2017 with tokens as well. Any boom cycle draws a lot of interest. People that don't know or understand the market attempt to do things, fail at those things. And then the technology gets blamed for those people's failures or, manipul or purposeful manipulations. And things like Constitution down which was an idiotic idea from its inception, oh a very idiotic idea, forming a DAO, putting a whole bunch of money together to buy a piece of paper um, that, that, is in, that has no tangible value that can be distributed or coordinated in any significant way in an effort to, to, um, to uh, preserve history. That's a, a misleading. And that's the thing is, a, I think there's a common misconceptions that because... I, and all in all, I went to I, all of us went to college. You know, journalists aren't naturally. I'm not saying there aren't smart journalists. A lot of my friends are journalists, and there's some very intelligent journalists and ones that know. But by and large, journalists aren't the most in the know about the things that they write about. They're really great at research and writing about those things. And lots of times, that point of failure now gets misinformation for people who don't get applicable information from actually doing the thing or studying the thing, they get their information from the news or from reports. That's and fine. that leads to levels of mass manipulation. And that happened with DAOs, happened with NFTs, happens with tokens, because those who, and, and, it's, and it's at every layer, the people at the top of the company have previous success at doing something or got a degree from here or there, but don't really understand the thing. It takes a long time uh, there's a the law of mastery, 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours is 3.42 years, eight hours a day, five days a week. Very few people have spent that much time with crypto. But then to become a grandmaster may take another three and a half years. Then to become a, someone who can create a grandmaster. So now you're looking at 11 years of experience and how and there's so few people that have that. And the few that do are busy doing other things rather than talking about the thing um so back so back to constitution dow for the listeners who aren't familiar with that it was a organization that was put together to buy a copy of the constitution and uh they raised millions and millions of dollars i think in like 14 days uh I, or something silly and it was just like i the one thing that drew me to that was like well why the hell are people buying the constant like well, I don't, it, it, to me it was like a demonstration of the tech in a way but then it was like man they raised a lot of money in a very short amount of time based on a limited level of trust-based or technology that was supposed to be trust-based, right? But it like, I don't know. They, they raised 47 million, um, but they actually lost the bid in a Sotheby's auction. And then they couldn't give it back. Um, 
but that's the thing. The thing is that that's the like. So one thing is like if you look at outlets like Decrypt and things like that, and actually have people who have experience around this thing or who understand the thing, they talk about it differently. But running a press run on the news exposes this stuff to millions of people. Oh, these guys are buying the Constitution. Oh, I want to get into crypto. I want to get into DAOs. Okay, I, this sounds like a great idea. I love the Constitution. America, you know, and America without the A. You know? Yeah, just the M. Started with the America, M. America, <laughs> you know, you know, so greatest country on earth. I'm going to go buy the Constitution, not understanding that this is, that there's fallacy. And that's what new, you know, nine out of 10 startups fail because people that are able to access the capital are those who present the best, not those who actually do the things. Companies have 60% of their working workforce who are really ineffective um, in, in the, in statistically ineffective at doing their jobs because they were best at creating a resume and best at going through the, the going through the application process with a person that is not the actual person who runs the company, who cares about the company, but a person who cares about um, hiring people that they like and that they agree with, you know. So that kind of leads to things that leads to these mass. A lot of things that I wrote about early on were as they, have you read the selfish gene, Jeremy? Uh, no, I actually have it. It's I haven't read it yet, but I bought it based on your recommendation a long time Excellent. ago. Excellent. Yeah. So, so there's a book and it was written in 1976. And it's crazy about the, this time of, of uh, on the on the planet. And during the the, the late 60s, early 70s, certain people became superstars. Uh, in 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 way for their thought processes, the Alan Wattses and these different types of people were able to become this mega star status that hasn't happened in any time since then. Scholars aren't really that you know aren't really that invi invited in to talk about things. But there was a guy named Richard Dawkins. He wrote a book called The Selfish Gene. Selfish Gene introduced this science called memetics. So lots of people hear about a meme and they think about this meme on social media and what's been called a meme and they believe that that's a meme but a meme is actually the a living and breathing thing that may be intangible an idea and they say that in a selfish gene talks about the viral nature of these things and they, they want to live the abc song the happy birthday song the word no um you know and things like that that become and that's what happens i think that memetics takes over, the viral nature of things takes over. Everybody wants to sit, everybody um, becomes an expert, especially in a burgundy market. Everyone instantly becomes an expert, desires to be expert. And I think that we've just seen the rise of, of mass action around memetics in a way that we've never been seen in human history due to the prevalence of social media. And that's gonna continue accelerating, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you how do you balance Israel? You've got a ton of experience in a lot of these technologies. I mean, years and years and years invested in, you know, working as a uh, consultant, getting brought in uh, as a partner to help start an organization, a company. And now you're moving on to starting building a lot for yourself instead of doing it for other people, which I think is really cool because uh, I can't wait to see what comes out of that. But um, what do you are you do you how do you how do you keep yourself um standing out in the crowd from folks that and speaking of memetics this is why i'm going there um you know it, first of all everyone turned into a web3 expert right and then ai kind of ai has been around forever and ever right but now this huge ai wave is happening you know everyone is now an ai expert right so like how do you how do you stand out as someone who actually has the skills uh, to, to do what you do versus kind of the noise in the marketplace? The sad thing is, I don't think that I'm the best at, um, at standing out. I think that oftentimes, like I said, you know, it's people that present well. There's somebody right now that gets hired to do strategic partnerships that doesn't have the connections that I have, but they have a great resume. They have, they're great at putting together a resume or whatever the case may be. So, but the thing that I do do is I'm constantly learning constantly so they say the plight of a visionary is seeing at dusk what others won't see till dawn so in 2008 I, at the end of 2008 i read the bitcoin white paper i didn't have to understand everything and i think that that's really where my cheat code comes in at 
is I can go from A to Z talking about string theory, quantum, quantum physics and things like that. I can go from one point in the universe to another point in the universe without traversing the universe. And a lot of people, they need to understand wormholes. Yeah. They're using they're wormholes like, to do it. And if you try, had to understand how your car worked before you drove it, you would not drive. If you had to understand how your refrigerator worked before you used it, you would understand. And a lot of people do that with these things. They, yes. um, they attempt to understand how they work. And some of us, we have different minds that can't maybe, we, and we need to apply, instead of trying to understand how artificial intelligence works, apply artificial intelligence to what you already do. Instead of trying to understand how cryptocurrency works, because you still don't even understand how the dollar works, or else you'd be a full force proponent of cryptocurrency. So if you want that is that is a that is a really 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 good point because like a lot of people think there is such a tangible nature to the dollar that it's like you know that went away in 1973 or whatever it yeah. was whenever the gold standard kind of went away. Yeah. Like that is, I mean, it is digital money. Like it is, it's almost an invention. Yeah, right? the dollar gets um, created. Dollars are created by debt. You go in the you go in the bank and you get a car loan. They're not giving you money out of that bank. They have a reserve. They are able to loan out ten times the number of the amount of money that they have in the bank. And suddenly, sixty thousand dollars is created out of thin air because you got a Lexus or whatever the kicks may be, an Audi or whatever the kicks may be. And now that money exists in the system. That money exists on paper. And then that debt is packaged and sold and marketed and put inside of people's 401ks and all of these different things. And that's what led to 2007, which led to the invention of, of Bitcoin. But back to how I stand so one thing I'm blessed about is like people like you, like this, because of this podcast, there may be someone that sees me. They, they, it becomes obvious that I know what I'm talking about. And then hopefully they bring me into their organization and they allow me to now give them the most valuable thing that I have, which is I come into businesses. And this is also too, it causes, it causes conflict because there's already somebody there that developed a plan. I come into businesses and I hack two things. I hack technology and culture. I live both of these things. I'm not a VIP at your concert. I'm not in the crowd. I'm in the trailers. I'm not, a, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, um, a person that's talking about technology. I'm a person that spends every single day spinning up things, building things. I looked at a, a I went to Vercel the other day and I saw a file and it said 10, 1,046 days ago, I was a biz dev focused on Web3. Um, and um, this is before Web3 became a popular term. And seven years ago, because in, a, in efforts to start trading crypto, I started learning machine learning and data science. And that that's what separates me is that I spent a lot of time during that time when you are thought to be crazy or, or it's thought to be impossible. And it really comes from, I really have to think like the Robert Heinleins of the world, the Dean Koontz's, the Stephen King's, the um, Frank Herbert's, Doom probably changed my life and formed my mind more than anything else. I saw the future and I've always waited for it. And then suddenly here we are and I'm prepared for it in a way that would be impossible for someone to instantly prepare looking through YouTube or taking some course over the net last six months or three years or whatever the case may be. Yeah. So when you when you get when you get brought in and I know you're I, I want to talk I wanna spend some time talking about what you're building now, too, because I think that's really important, really cool. The when when you're brought in by other companies to help them figure out this this technology culture intersection and, and build and achieve what they want to build. How do you manage uh, how do you manage when they don't want to listen to you and they think they're they think they have the answer, even though they're bringing you in. That's why most of my relationships will usually last about 60 days, 90 days, um, the majority. But this is the one thing that prepared me for this. I did business development for years. So this is nothing like I've been I do biz dev, whether I'm successful or not. If I make your business, I scale the business from three million to nine million in eight months and then they let me go. Um, uh, or, you know, I, I, I saved them $80,000 a month in services 
got them because they had a lot of services that they were doing. They didn't give me a raise. I was, I was in, so I was, I was kind of prepared around this, what for what's happening now. And so that's kind of, I'm used to that. And so if they don't, what I have to offer is my advice. The reason that you hired me is because I know something that, that you don't. If you don't take that, the one thing that's been validating, sadly, is that I get to see the failures that happen because they weren't unaware that I was giving them solid advice rather than I'm not a negative person. Jeremy, anybody that knows me knows I'm not a negative person. I'm not coming in here trying to destroy anything or tell anybody negative. If I tell you that it's not going to work, it's because I know I'm that kid that was in class and I would know the answer and I wouldn't raise my hand unless I knew I knew. I can have the right answer, but if I know I know, then I'm going to say something. And so usually, and so I got to see those failures or I got to see those pivots that ended up in the place where I was told, telling them to go at the first time. And hopefully they do that fast enough. But that's what I have done for years, even in common businesses. I basically helped change the aesthetics of websites when the web was really ugly, building out websites. That was my first beginning thing, changing e-commerce systems, adding in automation, upgrading the, the, the ability of a business. I challenge assumptions around people's business models because lots of times nobody thinks their kids are ugly. You know, everybody's got the cutest kid in the world. And that's what happens with businesses. And then I create a series of strategic partnerships to expedite their success. And if they allow me to do that, those three things, you know, help them hack things, improve efficiencies, help them expand the capabilities of their business around their assumption around what their business model is so that they can have a successful business model and then allow me and give me the capabilities, put me in a South by Southwest versus any other person in your company. And I promise you, the amount of relationships that come out for your company are going to be far, far more far reaching and broad, deeper because I form real relationships with a REAL. I'm not a fake person. I'm not just transactional. And, they're, and, and, and those, those people, if you allow them to, can expedite your process. A lot of businesses, they're trying to reinvent the wheel or they're trying to build things that are already built and they don't really understand that. The majority of successful companies Every, every company has what's called a stack. So go look at Amazon's stack. They've got a stack of these technologies. You're sitting here trying to build this email responder. They're already there. Or you might be trying to build something that's already built and become a failure when all you need to do is rewrap that instead of hiring engineers and wasting money. But you just don't know what you don't know. And it disallows you from being successful. And I think that the greatest leaders are those people and I try, uh, hopefully, you know, what I can be that, those people that listen to the people who they are leading and, lead, and, and, and leading with other leaders and forming. I think that the future, uh, going back to what Mark was talking about with DAOs, I think DAOs are so important because hierarchical systems are what are, is, are failing in this world right now. Hierarchical systems do not work. One person in charge going down does not work in government. It does not work in business. It doesn't even work in a family. Maybe your five-year-old knows more than you know at this moment about what they're talking about. And you need to be able to listen <laughs> sure. to that. And so heterarchies are the future of, 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 found of, of organizations. Heterarchies okay. allow for when a person is an expert at that thing, that person leads the thought processes and the actions around that thing and the organization gets behind that person. And the I call it, yeah, I call that spectral leadership. It's when it, when it moves around, right. And it's not fixed. Right. And it's just, yeah, spectral it's, it's such a fun, yeah, it takes, yeah, it takes way a, better than saying that's way better than talking about heterarchies. It takes, it takes a very now, brave, that one. takes a very brave leader. Do you mind if like, if I just a couple of questions for me on business development that you've just spoken about there. So um, you, you mentioned that nine out of 10 startups fail. And I, a question on that, which is maybe unanswerable, how much of that is down to it simply doesn't work and the product is shit? And how much of that is because the people are bad at execution, they're doing it wrong, they don't know, they don't have the humans. And, and if that's whatever the answer to that is, if people are relying more on AI for their business development, 
does that statistic of nine out of 10 startups failing lower? Do we come to a point where like, is the market geared up for a six out of 10 failure rate? Like it, the market isn't saturated. Like how, how will AI affect that? And what does that mean for culture? What does that mean when you have five out of 10 startups succeeding because AI is writing the development plans and executing the marketing plans and doing all of this stuff better than the people who were failing? Yeah, so one out of 10 startups fails in the first year. So I think we can chalk up those bad ideas or inability to raise capital. That's another thing is when I look for co-founders or when I look for teammates and I look for people that I want to work with, I have a saying. And it says, I, I want to work with missionaries, not mercenaries. Um, and people that are true believers, and I don't, and I can tell if you're here for the money. Cause that, and if you can't hide that, you don't believe in this technology. You see this technology as a way to access capital. And those built and building those types of people with those types of people, they can't deal with the ups and downs of the company. And lots of times a lot of companies fail just on that. Somebody needs to feed their family, this and that. And that's why I think that fractional leadership, while you're still over here building whatever, where you still got an income source or you'll have multiple income sources, it will allow people to build more things and increase the success rate because the company won't fall apart just because they can't pay salaries. That's another bad starting place. And then I would say, if the product is shit, that is the team. And that is the team's fault, and it is the fault of the leadership. And if they, there are delays, there are fault of the leadership. And I think that leaders really, by and large, one of the biggest problems that I've seen, and why a lot of these companies are, are unsuccessful, is because, and that's why, so, the, so lots of times the leadership is non-technical. Then they hire a technical team. The technical team, and this happens, I'm going to say the other example, but this happens a lot. So then they hire a technical team. The technical team needs to make a living. They don't need to deliver a product. They need to make a living. I know a guy that worked at a major ad agency. He came up with a solution that would blow up an, an artist or a product a thousand X in a month. And they said, please hide this product and figure out a way that we can sell them something every month. And so you're hiring a person that doesn't actually want to build your thing can't maximize, can't do that because they will be out of a job if they build your thing. They're stretching it out and you're not technical enough to know that they're lying to you when they tell you that a marketplace costs a quarter million dollars and that this is more complex than it is or this and that. You're not technical enough to look at the code and know that they're not doing what they're saying that they're doing. I know guys that have serially done that that are still getting funded by the same people that they already screwed right now for their next company and the people have no idea and um and they're just good at playing the system and that's the problem with systems is that people that are good at manipulating the system are the most successful within it we see it within politics we see it within business we see it within all these different things and that's not the people that are actually able to move the needle so i would say that i would say that it was it has a lot to do with the team now on the other side you have highly technical people that can build amazing things. He built this thing in his basement. He's, he's, he's astronomically smart, but he doesn't know what he doesn't know. And you, and you have these technical people that the internet was ugly for years because they, the guys that were building it didn't care that it was ugly. Um, computers and, and, and Bill, uh, Bill Gates, if you look at the two most successful tech giants of the 80s, it was aesthetics. It was aesthetics. Windows was an aesthetic change and a difference in the way the mouse was a Hewlett Packard thing. Bill Gates saw it and said, oh, you know what? I can build an OS that utilizes this mouse. And Hewlett Packard didn't become Microsoft. Bill Gates studied Sanskrit and all these different things while he was in college. And he said, we're going to change the way that fonts work. And we're going to build a computer system that uh, later on that you can run your music software on better and all these different and your film editing software on better and they carved out a place for themselves around aesthetics around experience and a lot of engineers have this emotional place where they're not connected 
to the feeling of a thing. We were talking about discord earlier. Who's ever creating discord doesn't understand that their thing will fail o- over time, regardless of the success, or it could be massively more successful if they paid more attention to the user experience and the aesthetics of their platform. And that's and so that's another way that people kill what they're doing is they're overly technical and they're not experienced. And I think that nine out of 10, especially in crypto, the reason that they're all failing, the reason that a lot of layer ones are failing and a lot of products fail is they're not hiring people that can actually hack culture. They're not hiring the Jeremy's. They're not hiring people like myself that can actually, I can actually get you a million more users guaranteed with what you're paying somebody else. I'll take half and put users in my budget I'll take half and do the thing and I can move the needle significantly on your thing and get cool people to understand it like they never did before. I I literally watched the world open up when I was able to get on an app called Clubhouse and explain crypto. And then people, friends, they I say friends without a D. So they say friends without a D. OG. I call people in crypto OG. So now everybody in crypto is OG. And I sat there and I explained the philosophy behind it. And I watched the whole world change in front of me and didn't even realize until people told me later on that that was what was happening. And then there was a people doing documentaries and it said, why are there so many people in crypto from New Jersey? Well, I was sitting in New Jersey on Clubhouse talking about it. And that's the way that social media works is it pushes to the local people first. So there's this, but anyways. Yeah, I want to, no, that's, that's super, super cool. I love the um, missionary versus mercenary thing and kind of your, your framework and uh, process for identifying that. I think that's really important because, you know, you want to, you want to be involved with something that is, uh, that is not just merely transactional, that's building something for the future that you see you're a you're a sci-fi guy right i mean i know you didn't you didn't mention like arthur c clark and all of those guys but i'm sure that's yeah, in right, there yeah. as well i'm reading i'm reading a book right now called where's my flying car okay. um i can't remember the author right now but it's freaking fascinating this dude goes and basically fig- he, te- he tells everybody we've had the technology for flying cars since the 1930s and the reason why, here's the reason why we don't have them. And it was an energy discussion, a nanotech discussion, a regulatory discussion. And from an innovation perspective, and I think you kind of hit hint on hinted on this with um, the people that you work for that end up like, and we when they, they bring you in as a consultant and then they're like, yeah, you know what? I don't really quite buy into that. Well, innovation to me has two failure points potentially, right? There's There's one failure to imagine, right? failure for imagination to kick in and then a failure of nerve. Right. And this comes out of this book. And I was like, Holy crap, you're absolutely right. Like innovation can't work unless you have the really cool, amazing, lofty, big idea. And then you also have to have this button that says I'm all in on this. Uh, you know, right. Fly, I mean, flying cars are a really bad idea. Like, believers, I'm all, that's, I'm the, that's the true believer. That's the state of a true believer. Have you been on the roads? Yeah. Have you driven a car recently, Jeremy? Like people, you don't give the population flying cars. I don't care if it's ready. They don't need it. Dig it. It wouldn't funny. be, I don't think, I think that it would, you know, one thing is that we have to create autonomous vehicles. So the, the flying, but I don't think that flying cars are the answer. Um, if the way our blood moves through our body is with these veins and we have miles and miles of veins and things like that inside of our body, and so I think, or yard, I don't know how many, but we the, the way that it moves around. So I think that tunnels and tubes and mass transportation is the answer. If we look at how Europe moves versus how the United States moves, um, it's because we chose roads. And so traveling around the United States, flying cars are called planes. <laughs> Thrive <laughs> Fighter, best, that's best comment right of the there. week. Flying cars <laughs> are called planes. And, I love it. Um, and definitely the sky is not ready for people, a whole bunch of people wanting to drive on their own. But Jeremy, you, you struck on a point that the nerve and what I've noticed is that the larger the organization, the worse that problem becomes because there's a person trying to preserve their idea that they're introduced as an expert. And if we look at the failures, especially within major sports leagues, 
to utilize this technology or major record labels because they hired, there's somebody in there that's supposed to be an expert. There's somebody who asked for this job and that person is trying to protect their ideas rather than move the needle forward. And they're trying to protect their understanding of the thing and our biases. Um, if we're unaware of them, um, that's one thing is just to be aware of your meditation is a big thing that changes everybody's life that does it. But if you're unaware of your biases, if you're not constantly open to new ideas and new, that's why I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist anymore is because, oh, there's a better idea. And then I was an Ethereum maxi. I missed an opportunity to 100x within the Solana ecosystem. I used Solana and I really and I instantly understood, oh, my God, I could build merchant systems with this. This is an instant transaction. Why haven't I been looking at these other alternate chains? And then my and then my thoughts changed. But I had already missed a significant opportunity to do to build do something and build within that ecosystem because of my biases. And I think that within large organizations, we have compounded biases. I thought that companies worked before I was in corporate culture. I used to just work with small business and manufacturing businesses and things like that. And I thought that corporate culture worked as this these these um these kingdoms where everyone agreed on one thing, but really it's fiefdoms, fiefdoms, each one inside each department and each individual within that department jockeying for position and disallowing the common growth and the common cause because everyone is attempting to preserve their necessity. Um, and I believe that that's the collaboration is the currency of the future and that you don't have to feel threatened by someone who knows more than you about a thing, what you have to do is you have to allow for your, your skill set that you already have mastered to now accent that and help promote that to, so we can have successful outcomes. And so this is where the culture, you. this is where the culture feeds the, t feeds the tech, right? We're, we're talking about uh, awareness of ego, right? On the individual level, uh, which is something I've really been digging into over the last, you know, eight or 10 years. And it's a powerful thing, but it's hard to do, right? It's really hard to tell yourself that you're wrong and, and you're probably looking at something with some blinders on, right? But that multiplies when you have a leader in an organization and then a leader on top of that organization, then leaders in industries that that organization is a part of. And the exponential factor of that creates a lot of, um, uh, failure of nerve kind of stuff from innovation because it's a self-preservation model, um, which, which I think is really interesting. It, I could riff on that stuff for, for a long time. I we're, we're, we're getting close on, we're actually a little bit over, but I want to ask a couple more questions. Um, if you, if you have some time and Mark, are you still good? I'm still good. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want to, I want to get your thoughts on a couple of hot buttons that, that we're hearing about right now, especially the open sea royalty thing um that's out there right now what's uh what's your take what's your take on what's happening there as a progenitor of this thing as a person who witnessed the rise of nfts and played a part in it there would no there would be no nfts all the organizations all the 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 nft projects the board apes and all that they would have never came to life if it wasn't for artists and the reason that artists were interested in this is because the the common art market right now you sell a piece of art that person owns that piece of art. You may have sold it for 50,000. They sell it for 5 million and you don't get, and there's starving artists and old artists that aren't able to gain from that. The change, the only reason that NFTs were interesting in the beginning was that perpetual royalty. The only thing that drove this to be popular discussion started with artists because of that and any organization or body of people or anyone that believes otherwise or attempts to do otherwise should fail. Who knows? Does everybody else know that? Does, because do the people that are explaining this to people, do they have that perspective of the history of the thing? Were they there? Can they talk to it from that per perspective within the company or within the media or whatever the case may be? Who knows? But they should fail. It is antithetical for the foundational understanding that created artists were the, the now artists are in the background of the NFT discussion. It has come in, it has come and gone, but with all things, there may be a rise over time. Art 
was paired with NFTs, with physical works um, years before this. And I hopefully that's a place that we go back to where the physical works and then the NFT acts as a method of provenance and then still gives that person that perpetual thing for the NFT. And the rise of digital art as we enter into the metaverse will be perpetual because people will be able to skin their their living space eventually will reduce the screen to a size of a contact or something like that. And so in 30 years, we'll see that, but that should be necessary. There's no, Go no ahead. excuse for it. And it shouldn't, and any, and I, and it, within the community, the community should uh, all pull back from that platform. And I will never mint how on, on OpenSea. Technolo technologically, how far are we off? I mean, we can't help, digital art, pure digital art, NFTs that have already come before, but going forward, having, how far the ERC tokens from having perpetual royalties built in forever, built into the code. So the platforms like OpenSea can't decide whether the percentage, how far from that is Ethereum, is it already there? Where the, it's already there, it's already there, but it's, it's, a, it's a consensus, right? Everyone has to adopt a certain way of building the thing. The ERC 721, isn't or the ERC eleven fifty five don't have that they don't have into that. the thing. So that would be you know that would be that is that it has to be a consensus around it. And we're still doing this. We're still developing that consensus around the um, the metaverse standards. And once we build in those standards, you know that that will be perpetual. But we're not the technology exists. Common adoption of the standards. Um, do not exist because these people aren't necessarily, and that's what why, especially within crypto, a lot is failing and a lot of people continue to be turned off because the people who have been giving mon money are not believers in the technology, in what it can do, in the freedom that it offers, in the benefits. They are grabbing at the money that they can make off of the thing and we get to see the effects of that. Um, in the failures and in and in the and how it results in the public, how people lose their money. Okay. Right then. Good, uh, good, good spot to to wrap it. Uh, is this this was such a great uh, great time? I know we could dig around on a lot of stuff for for a lot lot longer. Um, before we get out of here, where where can people find more about the projects that you are digging into? that you're building and um, learn more about your version of this future that you see. So I've been, uh, I've been diligent lately about releasing articles on LinkedIn. Probably will have some medium stuff. I stream this on, on Twitch and YouTube and going to start producing more content right now. I'm really digging in. I'm building an AI uh, co-founder uh, for this nights and weekends. I think I see some of the, members of nights and weekends in the chat at build space. Thanks to Farza and all those guys. Um, this is called the, uh, this is ICGNU. This is a brand I've been working on for the last 18 years. And um, I've got the ICGNU collective. Um, I in ICGNU.xyz should resolve to that. There's some type of, we were just talking about mighty networks and stuff like that. There's something going on with Mighty Networks where they'll send you to Cloud Fair. If anybody wants an invite, I'm Israel Wilson, Israel S. Wilson on Twitter, Israel S. Wilson on Clubhouse, um, Israel Wilson on LinkedIn, and I'm always open to conversations, DMs um, when, I, when I'm capable. And, um, and I'm, I'm headed on to another podcast tonight and more and more of these things in the future. So they'll be able to see that. I'm also releasing a book about how to bootstrap a startup with AI. And so be on the lookout for that. And if they um, if they want to have a direct connection to this and to me, there's a project on which is listed on OpenSea. I mentioned on, a, on the OpenSea contract and it's the ICGNU collection um, on OpenSea. And that will give them lifetime access to all of the different things that I'm doing. Amazing. And I, and and you're I would a just holder echo, as well, Jeremy. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, I, I, I would echo if anyone's digging into a, a concept related to Web3 or related to technology at the intersection of tech and culture, but need, need to unpack it or need someone to kind of 
uh, handhold them through some of the early starts or, or even learn like a tangible meaning out of some of the applications of some of this technology. Israel is one of the best to, to talk to about that, uh, to leave a con every conversation I've had with him, I've left it knowing more uh, tangibly about something than I had before uh, I had the conversation. So I've always appreciate that, uh, Israel. I um, want to give a quick wrap to our uh, to our sponsor, Ripple. Ripple yeah. With a W, Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E.com. We'll post some links there. I think uh, some folks in the chat uh, were asking for links to, um, uh, to where we could see the freelancer board and all that. So we'll post those in the follow-up but thanks again to dixie and ray over at ripple um marketplace basically pairing vetted talent to uh to creative projects they do a great job of it over there their interface is awesome um and feel free to reach out if you have any questions dixie's always around um and i think there were a couple other questions was it hakeem hakeem my hat this hat was from uh, Imogene and Willie up in Nashville. I couldn't. I saw it on Instagram and I couldn't resist, so uh, so I had to jump into it. Um, Mark, any closing thoughts um, for this one? Yeah, I, I don't want to to kick off again. I was wanted to. There's a lot of stuff I'm going to follow up on this and share with with our audience because I wanted to. Israel's written some really interesting stuff on diversity and it, 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 how to solve the problem of diversity and what solving getting more diverse workforces into web three and emerging tech means for the culture of emerging tech. So I'm going to share some of that. There's that's also a big book. That's well, my yeah. big book. And that, that's what I'll be speaking on at South by Southwest. Well, I'm going year. to be, I'm going to be sharing you know more I mean? of that with our audience as well, because I think it's important and they should read it. And there's some also some other stuff, which I found cool on tipping points as well. So I'm going to talk about that. And so, but I'm going to leave the audience with a quote, with a tweet from Israel which I liked and I think is a good way to, to sum all of this up. Um, remember that the last thing to grow on the tree is the fruit. Definitely. Ooh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Check, think, awesome. Thinking on paper X, Y, Z, and I'll be I'll, like, I'll publish lots of your stuff and some links to your hat and the brand and the, um, the replacement for Discord, which I'm excited to explore Oh yeah, Amazing. I look forward to join the com join the community. Jeremy's already a member, and we have a po a recommended podcast and books. And I I would love to add thinking on paper to that recommended section. And it's a co collaborative effort for the community. It's not mine; it's ours. And I signed up for Ripple the moment that you mentioned it. So I look forward to talking to Dixie um, and becoming a member Amazing. of Ripple. So you guys brands may be able to find me on there in the near future. You'd be a great fit for that. Oh, yeah, wow. absolutely. So glad you did it. Um, awesome. Well, uh, audience, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Again, uh, thanks for listening. Again, find us thinking on paper.xyz. We're on Spotify. We're on YouTube. Uh, drop us a line if you got an idea uh, or a uh, comment or whatever. We're always open to listen. Thanks again, guys. See you next week. See you next week. Great conversation, guys. Have a good one. Ciao.